Pour yourself a cold one. They strike them, huh? And listen to Russ Tucker break down the top college prospects on another tasty edition of The College Draft. Yeah, it's Daddy Soda time here on the College Draft Podcast, presented, of course, by DraftKings. Happy 4th of July. There is no shot we're actually recording this 4th of July. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It's 30 minutes of delicious, delectable content relating to the only podcast I'm aware of that's actually three podcasts in one. I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years, bunch of podcasts, including this one. He is Emery Hunt. He's an absolute stud. One of my favorite guys in the media, period. You got to check him out on social media at F ball game plan. And today's episode was actually made for him. Like the, 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 the whole idea about the topic, everything was for Emery was for today. So uh, we are doing this show a little bit early because of the 4th of July holiday. We hope each and every one of you has an outstanding holiday. Be safe, especially when it comes to how much you drink, how much you eat, and most importantly, what you do with fireworks. Don't be a moron. Uh, there's so many injuries, firework injuries every year. Don't need to see that. Emery, we never done this before. I am extremely excited. Let's talk about the other leagues, man. Like, we've got some legit other leagues now. And not even the CFL. Maybe we'll do that with Russ Landy sometime. But I'm talking about the USFL and... I saw you're already doing interviews with XFL head coaches recently. So I don't know which – let's start with the USFL since they actually played. Again, you got to check out Emory at FBall Game Plan on Twitter, Football Game Plan on YouTube. This show can always be watched on YouTube, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, as well as hitting us up on social media at Ross Tucker Pod. But Emory, your thoughts – on USFL. I'm giving you as blank of a slate as anybody can possibly get um, to just talk about the league in general, anything that stands out to you, then I'll get more specific. It, first of all, it, it, it was great to watch this from start to finish, literally from conception to or inception or whatever the word is, conception <laughs> to completion, right? And th- this week is a, the championship game, July 3rd. Uh, I'll be out there at Canton, Ohio for the title game. And it's going to be fun to see the culmination of of what we saw transpire all throughout the spring from March, from when everything was kicked off to April when the season started to now July 3rd. It's been a great foundation for guys to get fresh tape. And that's my whole thing. You know, we spend so much and we'll get into the, the, the details of it, but we spend so much time grading prospects, talking about prospects. And for guys to get to the NFL, they get to that 90-man camp roster, and then some guys get cut, and then that's it. We wash our hands with it. Well, not nah, th- these guys are still good guys, and you know this raw is better than anybody. That there's always going to be guys that you watched and said, "Man, that dude's really good," but man, we just don't have the space for him. I wish he could have stayed on. Well, here's an opportunity for him to continue to play, get those on-field reps, those. Uh, live practice reps because one thing you can't do in practice is fake live action. And so these games in the USFL, this entire league has been exactly that, a way for guys to really stay active, keep playing, stay in the football shape, get paid for it, and have success. And and I'm glad there's an outlet for that. I just hate when people poo-poo the other leagues as if, you know, their playing doesn't matter if it's not in the NFL. But every other professional league has some sort of alternate league where guys can go make money whether it's the euro leagues in basketball or even the g league or even uh, you know minor league baseball or playing in other countries central american countries you can go play ball and get paid that's what we need in the states and that's why the usfl and next year the xfl fills a void you know i always think it's amazing just kind of a side note like the guys in triple a baseball or you know, the G League in basketball, I it might it might be different now. But at one point, the G League, I think, was $18,000. And 
And those guys get like called up to 10 day contracts and they make more money in the 10 day contract than they do the whole season in the G league. And what people don't realize is there's guys at the bottom of every roster Emory in the NBA that it's debatable whether or not they're better than the best guys in the G league. It's very debatable. And it's the GM that can tweak it one way. Maybe it's because where the guy got drafted. Maybe it's because of whatever. But it's close. Same thing with AAA baseball and the majors and the difference in the money there. Same thing with the US, it's USFL and the NFL. It is just, it's always struck me. It's like you're, you're getting millions, a lot of these guys, or very, very modest income. It, it always feels weird that there's like no in between. Right. And I feel like when you, I feel like it shouldn't be an issue in the NBA or Major League Baseball because you're making money hand over fist and you're getting that return on your investment. The NFL, we know, is all about will it make money for me? Because if, if it was all about development, they wouldn't have shuttered NFL Europe in 20 in 2007 because it was perfect. Imagine if they stayed with NFL Europe. We may have seen all of those teams become NFL Europe instead of trying to play games, try to play games over there and you have to try to drum up interest. You could have developed those guys over there and had your own Europe division a part of the NFL. Uh, so we know it's all about money. Otherwise, the NFL, and I wrote this in an article on footballgameplan.com in 2016 in the summer, each NFL team, is set up to have its own developmental team. When you think about it, 90 men guy, 90 guys go to camp. So you're saying right there, these 90 guys are NFL level type athleticism. Talent is is you know a sliding scale, but you're gonna cut 45 of those guys. There's your developmental roster right there. There's your triple A roster right there. You could have your New York Giants and your you know, Brooklyn Giants, have them, you know, play a diff in a different, you know, area or whatnot, play on a Wednesday. They are still in football shape. You still run the same system. Each team can have their own developmental team. You could stream it on the team's website. You know, they already have their in-house media production and all that good stuff. So the league can do it. It's not like the owners are hurting for money to pay an additional 45 guys. You don't have to, you could pay them practice squad salaries. You know, instead of paying them the millions of dollars that you're paying the guys on an active roster. Therefore, when you call somebody up, they're right there in football shape. They understand your system. They're running your plays. They understand your terminology. It's a seamless transition. You can send guys back down on assignment just like you would do AAA. But a league like the USFL and the XFL has an opportunity to really, if, you, if you're if you on the cusp, on the fringe, you can be a professional USFL player or a professional xfl player and let that be your standard and i think we'll start to see there's a i personally believe ross that if i'm a guy like a stetson bennett or an emory jones or um you know a, let's say someone that that you know if you were coming out of college now if you're a tim tebow and you know the league is not going to give you a chance i'm going to go bypass this whole draft process in this bs that i'm going to go through and go directly to the USFL or XFL. If I'm a JT Daniels, why would I go transfer to West Virginia? I'm going to play in the USFL against pro talent and perhaps get drafted from there or continue to work on my game and elevate my game. And then free agency, I'll sign where I want for a max deal. So I think these alternate leagues have a purpose. And if there, there's a unique opportunity for them to attack the transfer portal and attack guys that should be, um, that why would if you're a DJ Uyunglele, why go back to Clemson this year? Go to USFL, play pro talent, get paid, and then make your move from there. I have a million things to say. Just listen, to you. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this subject. One of which is think about like Kurt Warner and James Harrison. I mean, it they were whatever whatever Super Bowl that was at the end of the 2008 season, Steelers Cardinals. They were two of the star three or four players in that game, both NFL Europe guys. And I'm not sure either one of them ever sticks in the NFL without the NFL Europe experience. The other thing I think is really interesting in hindsight, NFL Europe was losing $32 million 
right? Which comes out to a million dollars per team. That seems short-sighted. For a million dollars per team to not be able to have that presence in Europe and to continue to have, you know, to develop these guys, especially quarterbacks and linemen and receivers. And they had spring football on television, like NFL Network. They had so much programming and they really could have probably fought off the USFL or the XFL because these guys are being allocated by NFL teams. They've got the team on the help. Like, I, I feel like it was really short-sighted. Uh, the, bro, listen, they totally agree. And seeing what they had then with Germany and all the teams in Germany, it became NFL Germany pretty much because you had all those teams like the Ryan Fire, Frankfurt uh, Galaxy, um, the Hamburg Sea Devils, Amsterdam Admirals, all these teams in Germany. Um, it, it Now they're going to play an NFL game in Germany. Well, you had that already in place like you said you could have expanded to let's say 16 european teams strong teams um and had that as your you know two teams could be allocated to one franchise and you send your guys over there you're right it was so short-sighted it was a drop in the bucket they're paying that in fines or any kind of initiative that they're throwing out there uh you know with either decals or logos on the field in the back of the end zone you know that was your that was your fun for development. It cost you nothing. Develop coaches, refs, everything. And I agree with you. It would have fought off you know, all these iterations of these spring leagues, the UFL, the USFL, the XFL 2.0, the, the USFL 2.0. All of that would have been you know, null and void, not a chance for it happening, had they just had a deeper vision of what they potentially had in Europe. One of the things I like about Emory – He's not afraid to kick it old school with vintage-inspired polos made for modern living from Express. He also is not afraid to find statement shirts in bright colors, prints that pop, and lightweight fabrics. Neither am I. So be like me and Emery. Find something for every destination at Express online or in-store. All right. What were some of your specific, Emery, takeaways from the USFL season. What I I really loved is that you the games were e uh, efficient, they were competitive. Every game outside of one was a blowout. Um Michigan beat Pittsburgh 24 to nothing. Outside of that, every game was in a one possession game or at least a, a possession in the in a unique onside kick where you get a possession play to go forward on fourth and 12. If you make it, you keep the ball. So you really never are out of a game. And so I love that, that competitive games in the spring. And I hate it to, that everyone has jumped in and talked about the lack of fans. Well, duh, you're playing games in a hub city, which keeps calls down, which gets you to year two and three and beyond. Um, everyone talks about, oh, you, you know, you got to play in front of the fans. They had the beer snake at the XFL. Like the beer snake is not making you money. You know, that that's losing you money. You know, forget the fans in the stands right now. It's about getting to year two. And that's why you played in the hub city. Uh, and so, yeah, Birmingham had a great turnout um, for their games, but it's hard to ask fans in Birmingham to go to all the games, despite how in a, you know cheap the tickets were. But fans, people were focused on the fans and stands and not realizing you're watching a TV product. We learned during the pandemic, the first part of the pandemic, that we will watch anything as long as it's on TV, even football without fans. So, yeah, it's a TV product. You got to year two. I think that right there was huge. And you start to see more interest from the TV eyes perspective. It was sustained consistency over the course of, you know, you had your natural dips or whatever. But these are games that were played on Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter. I mean, we've never seen football games played on those holidays. And they did particularly well. So it gives you confidence that this could be something sustainable, which is why those are the two biggest takeaways. Uh, the competitiveness of the games, which tells you, which tells you the league is right there in terms of, you know, pro talent and that the, the business model I thought was great for a year one, you're not burning through money with travel costs and different uh, workers comp, you know, issues in each state and different stadium leases in each state. They, they, 
contain costs, and now they get to a year or two and they could build on that. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, people, if you, I, I look, I'll be the first one to say that a great crowd absolutely enhances absolutely uh, the product radio especially television uh there's no question i've called games where there's nobody in the stands you know maybe like some action games i've called nfl games during the pandemic when there was nobody in the stands and it makes a difference there's no question but there were reasons why there weren't fans in the stands just like there were reasons there weren't fans in the stands during the pandemic because they weren't allowed well, in this instance, all the games were in Birmingham, as you referenced. It was a made-for-TV product. And I think that if you needed fans in the stands to validate whether or not you would watch it, you're kind of small-minded, short-sighted. I don't know what the way to describe it is, but it's just like see the big picture. Understand the business model. One of the things I think is interesting – I've always felt like they needed another league, right? Ever since they got rid of NFL Europe, I felt like they needed another league. I will say, Emery, with 16 guys on practice squad, there used to be five, man. Um, when I was playing, there was five, maybe five of my seven years. In the last two, maybe they bumped it up to eight. But with 16, I think on some level, they think we are able to develop enough other young guys now that we have 16 on practice squad. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Is That puts a, a, a nice little strain on, you know, the amount of talent that you think you can get from NFL cuts. So you think these guys are going to, you know, you know, want to jump in and play games, but, you know, you're going to, hey, I, I can make more in the NFL practice squad than I can, you know, in playing a full season in your league. And the good part is, yes, you can. And we hope you do. But playing in the spring, you can get the best of both worlds. You can probably enhance your chances of not being on the practice squad by playing in the league in the USFL or XFL and then going to training camp and making the 53-man roster and being on the active roster. That's the ideal scenario. So that's why I, I, I targeted certain guys because we, we know this, Ross, like – we had a pretty good idea of our athletic skills and, uh, but 90% of guys all think they are top five picks, you know? And so you have to literally understand where you are as a player prospect and your chances It's mathematics. And so if I, again, if I'm Stetson Bennett, if I'm DJ, Uyunglele, he may get more of a chance than Stetson Bennett, but if I'm Stetson Bennett, once my last, when, once the bowl game hits, I'm, and if I'm the USFL or XFL, I am at these bowl games. I am at these all-star games with contracts in hand. I'm signing guys right now to bypass the, the NFL combine, the pro days. Man, just come play and then let the chips fall where they may. You know, you we've seen guys there. there this league, the USFL, had about 10 guys in it. There were 2022 draft prospects that bypassed it and went directly to it. And now we'll see if those guys get signed because they just put out fresh tape, you know, and it's like, okay, this guy can play. He showed against pro talent that he has, you know, pro skills. Let's bring him into camp. Otherwise we wouldn't have drafted him. We probably wouldn't have signed him or brought him in on a trial basis. And you don't really get an opportunity. You know, I feel like I would rather not all of them, but I'd rather take, some of the guys that really showed out in the USFL really played well against other professionals in their mid twenties than some of the real long shot undrafted guys. Look, I was an undrafted guy. I love undrafted guys. I was a real long shot undrafted guy, but I think there's probably a healthy mix there where if you can get a guy, some guys in camp that dominate the USFL, you should do that. Absolutely. And why wouldn't you? Uh, because now they've shown they have, you know, the capability. They're in football shape. Um, they have that that hunger now about them. And so now they can see a pathway for you to make the team and you can see a pathway for yourself to make the team. Yes, you scrape off the top because, again, the USFL 
already announced they'll, you know, obviously be back in 2023. They already announced they're going to have a draft. So they expect to lose guys. And it's probably going to be the guys that we're talking about, like your Chris Odoms, who has double digit sacks and leads the league in sacks and block kicks. He blocked four kicks, field goals. So that's a guy that's probably going to win defensive player of the year. And it's probably going to be in the NFL. So if you're the Houston Gamblers, okay, we need a defensive end. Now we go into our draft and we draft one. So you expect to have that turnover and it, it works hand in hand because you're playing in the spring. You'll be done in time. You'll be done July 3rd. And so training camp starts at the end of July. Bam, it works out perfectly. Better get some rest those two weeks. <laughs> right. Better, better, better get a little bit of rest. And then, and then, but that's how it used to be for the NFL Europe guys as well. Who jumped out to you, Emery? other than Chris Odom in the USFL? It was fascinating to watch Reggie Corbin, the running back uh, for the Michigan Panthers. Just a, a fluid, elusive runner. Um, great burst, great explosiveness. Cavante Turpin, the wide receiver coming from the New Jersey Generals, he was outstanding, made a play a game. Um, also affects the game as a returner. Uh, you look at on uh, defense, defensive lineman Toby Johnson for the New Jersey Generals out of Georgia. I legit swear this dude was in the backfield every play. And so you, you saw a big nose tackle, get pressure, get sacks, stop the run, make a diving interception. So you saw that Channing Stribling, uh, the cornerback out of Michigan, led the league in interceptions. Um, and every he was doing a great job of either playing man press or off man, baiting guys in, driving on the football. So you had these type of players making these plays. I think the next step for the league would be making sure the quarterback play is consistent. There should be no reason why you're it, – it, uh, their number one pick, Shea Patterson, cut, benched, and was on another roster uh, by the end of the season. Uh, another one of the top five picks, Ben Holmes, drafted in the top five by the New Jersey Generals, cut and was out of the league. And so you had backups. Everyone that they drafted later in the draft ended up being, for the most part, better than the starter. And so they got to get that properly correct – um, in terms of how you acquire QB talent, which is why you want to go after guys that were highly successful in college, that were winners, and also recognizable names. And I think that's something that um, that could be a pathway for them moving forward and how to get better. Because we know fans want to watch, you know, scoring. They want to see quarterbacks that they recognize. They want to see good quarterback play. They want to see the P.J. Walkers uh, of that nature. And I think that's where leagues like this – have to really, you know, focus on to get those guys in. But those are some of the, the standouts to me. Yeah, I think they focus on name recognition for the quarterbacks first, right? Like Shea Patterson, I know him from Michigan. I, I think that Paxton Lynch, I think that was a major emphasis early. I also saw your interviews with a bunch of XFL coaches. These are all guys I played with and against, like Heinz Ward, Anthony Beck. Uh, where was that at that you were doing all these interviews? And what was that about? That was the XFL showcase, the first one. It was in D.C. or on the campus of the University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland, um, at their indoor facility. Fabulous, by the way. Uh, I love going to Maryland games because they serve Chick-fil-A. So that's that's the best. You know, you, call, you get a game at Maryland, you know you're going to get good Chick-fil-A and good pizza, by the way, too. So you can eat twice at Maryland, Ross. You got to get in there and do a Terps <laughs> game. So, um, but... That was the XFL showcase, and it was great to talk to these guys. One, as a fan of the game of football junkie, I'm talking Wade Phillips, Rod Woodson, Terrell Buckley, Heinz Ward, uh, Mark Ross, the uh, executive vice president of football ops, who also works with the NFL Network and was with the Giants for a while. Uh, Princeton guy, um, you know, football player there, too. Uh, so talking to all these and Anthony Beck as well, you talk to these guys and you're like, man, you know, you can see the excitement in their face. And the fact that this league has gone a different route in terms of coaches outside of Wade Phillips, they got guys that are young, you know, that are former players that are now breaking into being head coaches. Although all of these guys have coached before at some level, I told a story to Terrell Buckley. I was like, you may not remember this, but we were at, I sat next to you at a Nassau community college game and we were looking at rasul douglas he was coaching at louisville at the time he said oh i remember that yeah we tried to get him to come to louisville he ended up going to west virginia so i, I was let him know like yo I, i'm always around you know what i'm saying so um and he remembered because we were sitting in this tight small press box that was fogged up windows that we couldn't really see um so 
that's the type of guys that they're getting to be. Henry, what were you doing at a Nassau Community College game? Because they had the running back for they played Georgia Military College, and the running back at the time had signed was gonna had signed with Auburn. He was the number one JUCO running back, but he was playing for Georgia Military, and I wanted to see how he was. The last name I believe was either Robinson or Johnson, but he wasn't the story of that day. Now I'll show you my notes on from 2016. I had a screen I, I, I on my on my website. I was like, Rasul Douglas is a Sunday player, and I don't. Whoever gets him is getting a stud. And I remember he DM'd me when he signed with uh, after the game or later on. He was like, "Man, I really appreciate what you said." He had signed with West Virginia. He still remembers that, by the way, of the write up I gave him at Nassau because he stole the show. Um, at, you know, and when we came to watch the running back, Javon Robinson was the running back's name, and so he he stole the show. And so it was it was fantastic to watch JUCO football out here in the Northeast, but. Um, I love the showcase. You had 200 guys there. They let the media watch the defensive workouts. So you had 100 guys in the defensive workouts. Then the 100 guys of the offense guys came in, but the media was not allowed that access. But he, he, just to see the passion in these guys' face of working out, hoping they get an opportunity, hoping they can find a way to just to play football for a living, no matter how much the salary is. And that's what the league, the XFL, and also the USFL is all about giving those guys that opportunity. How do you decide which one to try to play in or which one to go for? What's the right. difference? Uh, the first, the XFL is playing from February to April. So there's going to be about a two week overlap and the USFL is from April to July. So if you are, uh, it's probably going to come down to salary structure, coaching style, or, uh, you know, where the teams are playing. Um, if you have a chance to go to Dallas or Birmingham, you're probably going to go to Dallas. You know, if you have a chance to play in St. Louis or, uh, you know, uh, let's say Tampa, you probably want to go to Tampa. You know, so it all depends on where you want to where you want to be. Um, and also who's coaching it. And because both games are on network television, ABC and ESPN and Disney has the XFL. Fox and NBC has the USFL. And so you have, you're going to be seen. I just think it depends on where you go, how much you're going to make and your likelihood of, of maximizing your opportunity. So it got, that's why I'm saying if you're, if you're a college guy and you're in the transfer portal and you're, or you're a senior and you are starting to think about the, the pro game, um, start looking at these, these opportunities and decide whether or not you're going to try to you know, make the NFL team, or you can try to, if you feel as though you're not getting the buzz that you deserve, go jump in the USFL or XFL. XFL, you'd be done before the draft. And so you have a better chance of getting drafted by the NFL. USFL, you're done right before training camp. So you have a better chance of signing after they make all their OTA and mini camp, mini camp cuts. So I think it's going to be up to the, the, uh, the student athlete to make a wise decision on, on their future. Check him out on social media. That is going to be very interesting to see how that unfolds with the XFL and USFL. He's at F Ball Game Plan, Football Game Plan on YouTube. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker Pod. You can always check out the show on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. I think I like when the XFL plays better. I think it's smart to be a week after the season, but we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm glad they're going head-to-head -head next year. Although at some point it makes sense to have all the resources, all the money, all the coaches, uh, all in one. And I think that's what will end up happening at some point. Other than that, the keg is kicked. I'm all tapped out. Thanks for listening to the College Draft Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Fantasy Feast, Even Money, and the Business of Sports. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.